Hi, I'm Kevin Lee with the eMarketing Association. My day job is running Did It, and my passion venture is giving forward a nonprofit that uh, funds other nonprofits with cause marketing. Uh, Ali Marlowe Thomas is with me today. Uh, thanks for joining me, Ali. Um, I took a look at your bio, and it seems like you're an alumnus of, of both DoubleClick and Essence. Uh, but tell me the backstory. You know, how did you? Uh, arrive at your current mission? How did, you know, what was the, the backstory for, for founding? Um, uh, do you guys go, call it Adlibio or just Adlib? Adlib.io, I think, is our new up-to-date branding, Kevin, to be honest. But uh, Adlib is fine. For, for okay. Today. Right. Uh, I mean, there, there must be a shortened version that you use yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Just add. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Look, thanks so much for having me on. It's um, fantastic to be here. And yes, you're, you're bang on. I was at Essence started my career at Essence. Um, I actually like spent a couple of years in the police before I joined the agency world, which is kind of strange thinking back to it. Um, but then went into Essence and started as a trafficker, like lots of people who joined the, the agency world, um, learned a huge amount. And I think just at those early days, uh, the bubbling of programmatic was happening, you know, um, sort of 20, 2009, 2010, that kind of time. And um, yeah, I found myself with an opportunity to go and work on Invite Media at Google, um, which, was, which was then acquired, you know, uh, obviously on the double click side. Um, and yeah, really, I think spent the next kind of five or six years at Google focused um, very much on this creative space, which hopefully we'll talk a bit more about today. Um, but yeah, there was a huge amount uh, going on. And I think, you know, uh, Google really set me up for the, the founding of, of AdLib um, because I think I learned so much around, you know, the investment into the programmatic and the media and the data side. And I was kind of worried about the creative side, I guess. Um, yeah. So, Sorry, just to recap. So yeah, absolutely. Left, um, left Essence, joined Google. Uh, was on this fantastic roller coaster of a journey with Google, working on lots of different um, teams um, that ended up for the last few years working specifically on creative. Um, and I think, as I say, I started to to realise that like all this time and energy had gone into the media side, the data side, the targeting side, and like no one was really looking at creative and. I was talking to brands a lot about how they do better digital creative, what good digital creative looked like. And there was a reoccurring theme, which was everybody wanted to do it and no one really knew how. And I was like, this is a perfect opportunity for me. I'd, I'd been like fairly entrepreneurial in my youth. I think I'd, I had like a taxi sharing app when I was 19, which could have been Uber. I had uh, this, um, this sort of... Um, boat travel company we called the big boat week which encouraged people to go get like groups of youths and go on holiday and get drunk on these like big boats in turkey uh could have been some huge travel company but it wasn't both failed miserably and in fact the i remember i went on the second year of big boat week it was called and um i realized i'd created complete anarchy you know i was in turkey with 50 18 to 20 year olds all getting drunk on boats and I was like someone's gonna die you know like <laughs> someone's gonna die and I'm, I'm sure I don't have the right sort of insurance in place <laughs> but it was all good learnings and you know I learned how to sort of I guess get started with running a business and and get comfortable with taking risks you know which is really what I think drove me to to go beyond just oh this is an interesting idea to maybe I can activate and and engage on this idea outside of Google. Um, sold my flat, big decision. Um, took the money and got going, I suppose. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> kind of crazy, yeah, when you think back about it. Well, I, I've always been a big fan uh, within marketing of, you know, right target, right message, uh, right right time, right? So, uh, yeah. and, and, and I agree with you that the, the message and creative part, uh, that the DCO was sort of running years behind where it should have been. It was almost an afterthought uh, with regards to really, you know, starting to engage in, in DCO. So did, did, you, did you build it primarily to serve the agency community? Who do you really serve? Who's your primary uh, customer base? Yeah, it's such a really good um, question. And when I set out, I actually built it to serve the creative agencies. I was like, these guys 
they have got an opportunity on their hands, right? I was like convinced that there was this massive opportunity for creative agencies. They've been doing, you know, above the line TV commercials, et cetera, and all that stuff for years, right? And I was like, surely they see that there's a big opportunity on digital. You know, digital spend is up and to the right. TV viewing is down, you know. Um, I had this great graph, I remember, which was like spend on e-com, you know, up and to the right. You know, views on the Christmas, the average Christmas TV commercial, down and to the right. And I was like, God, this is going to solve all my problems. And I got my first contract with a creative agency who will remain unnamed. They were my first customer. And um, they never paid me. You know, it was like, a, so it was a lesson, right? I learned like, you know, there's, there's a lesson here. And, you know, I'm not saying, of course, that agencies, you know, don't pay. But in this instance, I was a small business with some consulting skills, not much else. Um, but I learned that, like, you know, actually I had to be sure that, you know, as I was growing the company, I could be confident that, like, that I was going to get paid. And so we started to go a bit more direct to brands. We actually do a lot more now with media agencies. They're a good partner of us. But I'm still, I'd be really interested in your view, Kevin, but I'm still convinced there's an opportunity for the creative agencies that is untapped here. Yeah, I think it, it's it's a little it's a bit complicated because you know the nobody wins awards doing banner creative or, or video creative for that <laughs> matter. So I think there's a bit of a headwind that you face in the creative uh, arena, um, and, and they often get left out of the conversation altogether. Um, I, I do think there may be an interesting opportunity within the media agencies because you know now that the majority of what they're buying is auction based in some form or another better creative fit in the campaign drives the ability to bid more, right? Because you're essentially using it as a, as a lever or a lever, as, as you might call it. <laughs> Very good, <laughs> to, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have had a clue what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, it, it allows you to, to add leverage to the equation because as, as you improve campaign performance through better fit of creative to the target and better creative overall, right? It empowers you to bid more and still hit the same ROI targets if you're doing any kind of direct response or even potentially branding metrics if you're, if you're going to use those as your KPI. So I think it's just a matter of sort of finding a way to, to align all the interests, right? Obviously, yeah. the, 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 the client whose money is being spent, they would, would love to see, you know, all, all pistons firing, right? But they don't necessarily always know how the sausage is made. Um, when they're engaging with their agencies, whether they're media agencies, full service agencies, or creative shops. So you, you, th there's a, a, a good reason to be speaking to all of them because you know, wherever you get your you know, influencer that, that will say, hey, this whole system will work better if the creative works better, right? Uh, I yeah, think that's I, part of the key. I agree. And I think that actually it's as much about enablement and data for the creative agencies as anything, you know, like, here we are with this like amazing opportunity to test and learn and build creative data sets in the same way over the last, you know, 10 years, we've been creating audience data sets, like creative data is something that hasn't been talked about, but actually in a world where walled gardens are appearing and it's challenging to engage inventory, like there is a consistency in creative. Like we do understand what works and where and why and against what audience. And that level of um, creative control, I think, and the learnings of how like specific creative messaging responds or uh, reacts to certain audience targeting is really interesting for the creative agencies. And I think that's the thing that's missing. You know, there's, there, I couldn't believe the fact that no creative agencies when I was at Google had access to the double click infrastructure. And that was all managed by the media agencies, because there was all this rich creative data in there, you know, against what site, what creative ad is working. And whilst that may not be like particularly, um, you know, award winning, as you point out, and I think I did actually do some analysis. We did this sort of deck a few or slide deck a few years ago where we looked at like how often digital creatives won awards at Cannes. And I think it was something like 3% of the time, you know, so you're absolutely <laughs> right. The data is there to support your your, your, your point. But I think there remains something interesting there, which is this creative data could be used to inform and educate the creative agencies to come up with better ideas, to come up with more creative insights, you know, and I think that's the thing that I'm really excited about for a more forward thinking partnership with creative agencies. And, but I agree, most of them now are 
engaged, I think, with this opportunity around creative data. <clears throat> so, so how does the platform work? Who would be interacting with it? Um, who would be uploading the creatives? Who would be monitoring it, right? And within the sort of ad ops community within a media agency, there are these roles that everyone knows what they do, right? With regards to traffic and creative and media optimization uh, or, and on the publisher side, yield management. But, you know, this is sort of, a, if, if people are really going to start thinking about creative more deeply, right? Who, who's touching it? Who, who's managing this? How does yes. it work? So it's a really good point. And the thing about creative is, you know, unlike media and potentially data, it's it goes right up to the top, right? Like everyone wants to know what the messaging is. Everyone wants to know what the picture or the image is that's out there driving the brand's, um, you know, I guess, engagement strategy. And so increasingly we're seeing actually the touch point being a few different people. Um, I think possibly the the least expected, but the perhaps the most, um, most engaged is actually like the brand manager or the marketing manager who have this opportunity in the platform to see and view the media plan, right? So at the moment, you know, these media plans are hidden away within the demand side platform or hidden away within Facebook. And what AdLib does is it pulls all of that targeting strategy into the platform and visualizes it and suddenly you know, the marketing strategist or marketing manager can see, oh, okay, here's what we're doing. We're targeting males age 40 and we're targeting, you know, football fans or soccer fans or whatever it might be. And then that transparency or exposure to the media agency gives them the opportunity then to say, oh, you know what, to this audience, we want to message in this way, or we want to show this content, or we want to control this narrative. And I think if you start to layer on top of that, you know, the marketing funnel, right? And you're like, actually, this is our upper funnel messaging this is our mid funnel messaging and this is our lower funnel down and dirty messaging suddenly you've got a huge opportunity for marketing managers to to test as well and i think between like wanting some level of control as a marketing manager uh the fact that the boss is very engaged in this stuff and the ability to test and learn more and more we're seeing brand managers engaging with this stuff and that that was unexpected to be honest you know i thought it would always be the media agency and i think the media agency will remain a huge user of our tool. Um, but I'm quite excited about that. Um, uh, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens over the next few years. But I, I think that could be a really interesting use case. So sometimes humans are not that good at predicting which creative will work best against those several audiences, whether they're at the sort of psychographic or demographic level or, or, or even more granular than that. So I assume your system, you know, either does its own optimization or gives the ammunition to the marketing manager or whomever is running it, the, the controls to do the optimization. Um, you know, how, how does one balance that sort of the desire of the marketing manager to get a particular message out and the fact that that's actually not the best message for, you know, 35 year old soccer fans? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because we were talking about this just today, Kevin, and we have an amazing creative director, Patrick Hollister, and we have this score that the whole company uses, one to ten, one being completely disastrous, you know, actually, you know, completely ruining the brand's perception, not on point, ten being a sort of miracle, you know, and we say, look, we're trying to, when we're working with brands, we're trying to get to 6.5, right? That's what we're trying to do because at the moment, most display creative is two two or three you know <laughs> and we ran through this creative and it's such a relevant question because we were running through this training just this afternoon and he was showing these creatives and i think we all think there's you know creative is so subjective but when we're looking at it most people are on point you know when we're actually we were scoring them all in the chat and saying like oh we think this is a six or a seven or a five or whatever the consistencies were unbelievable so there is that ability at the human end to look at this stuff when we really look at it, right? Mm. Not just glancing at it, but when we really look at it and say, actually, the messaging is clear, the image is on point, right? The call to action is like directional and relevant. Um, so I think the first thing is, yes, of course, there's technology to help on this stuff, but there's also like a human element. Right. On the technology side, hell yeah, we have a load of like really interesting tools and you know, we've got some super sophisticated models that we've built and a couple of examples are we have a, a memorability model, which directly correlates with ad recall. So, you know, when you're kind of like looking at your, for example, TVC, we can understand which scenes we think are most memorable. 
And there's usually things like, you know, face is more memorable than a product, which is more memorable than a price point, etc. And they, these things allow us to assemble that longer form piece of content into a shorter, more engaging piece of content using data. The second thing that we have, which I think is super cool, is we have these really powerful fatigue models. For years, I was working, when I was working at Google, I was wondering, like, why Facebook continuously outperformed Google, uh, from my perspective. It was, like, really interesting. And the only thing that I can boil it down to was that Facebook were consistent about saying how important the creative was and refreshing the creative. In fact, they demand you refresh the creative. Yes. They don't allow you to expose the creative to users. And they tell you your creative um, you know, score, right? They give you a score of um, how good they think your creative is. And it's actually kind of fascinating that they realize so how important, you know, there's tons of data out there, but the fact that they actually embedded that into their platform, I think just signals how important this stuff really is. Um, but fatigue is something we spent like a huge amount of time on, you know, can we understand how many exposures, you know, someone needs to see an ad before it's completely fatigued? Um, can we learn? what images or content has reduced fatigue you know other things that have signaled actually we know there's really good engagement with that content how can we get that how can we get that content out quicker i was talking a bit earlier about learnings cross channel you know do we see what works on google and how can we activate that content on facebook if that video is working on youtube what does that mean to activate it on you know viva or whatever you know there's tons of examples of this stuff um and there's something really interesting there i think as well um, creative hasn't had as much science attached to it, but there's an opportunity for it to be. Um, right. and that's I'm. It sounds like you're super interested in that stuff too. Yep, absolutely. Uh, interested <laughs> in the whole thing. You know, yeah. um, you, you mentioned uh, Facebook, and obviously, as one of the walled gardens, um, there's a limit to how much uh, information they allow to flow out of their walled gardens. Um, and you mentioned things like frequency capping or finding the optimal frequency and that's great when you're working on sort of an RTB or, or open architecture environment where you can sort of standardize around the, the number of impressions that are uh, delivered. But if you're using similar or the same creative within a walled garden and within the sort of programmatic ecosystem and indirect, you know, IO or PMP ecosystem, yeah. sort of how do you reconcile that, right? As, as a marketer, the fact that you have nearly zero visibility with regards to impressions and 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 that visibility is going down now with the depreciation of third-party cookies and you know within mobile the inability to track at the device level so you know you, you you've got some headwinds to deal with always always in our industry but i think this is a huge opportunity for creative kevin you know like i would of course i would say that <laughs> but you know like i think that all this stuff is going to hopefully redirect you know brands to think less about audience strategies, DMP segments, ad serving, attribution, and just think, right, let's have a think about what the user's actually going to see. And we talk a lot at AdLib about aligning creative and media, you know, which was kind of what you were saying, like brands are doing more and more. They're doing PMPs, they're doing open ad exchange buys, they're doing all this, these different strategies. Like if that stuff can be visualized and we can use, you know, as a creative technology company, we can surface all of the amazing work which the media agencies have done to build different plans to identify different audiences to identify websites to target and we can just purely say look what we're going to do is allow and enable brand managers agencies whoever it might be to build relevant content associated to those targeting strategies i think that's a win for the industry because we know relevance works you know pe personalization i think the days of like geo over weather, over time of day, over audience, I think they're going to go, right? I think the important thing here is about trying to be relevant to the targeting strategy that the media agency is deploying. And that's what we're focused on. Right. Um, and it seems to be working. You know, we do consistently see really good performance. We do consistently see um, higher engagement. And I think all those things are what really matters when it comes down to it. So we're going to lose some fidelity and accuracy on, on audience uh, as it relates to the de depreciation of cookies and, and, you know, the industry will struggle with its, its new cookie, whatever, whatever, it, uh, you know, 
rallies around. There's there's some things obviously the trade desk is championing, and there you know Live Ramp is obviously partially partnering, but also on its own you know direction there. But but you know it's clear that that context will continue to be a pretty important indicator of of you know to replace or, or augment uh, what we knew about a behavior or prior prior behavior or prior interest. So uh, do you feel like it, it's possible to get down to that level of granularity and actually do DCO around the pages that the people are on and the category that those pages are in as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm super excited about this. And, you know, the grape shots and those kind of guys of the world, they're going to resurface as big players. You know, I think this is going to be really, really important, like understanding the contextual page. And from a creative perspective, you know, if we can start to pass information about the makeup of that page it's really interesting for how the creative stands out like do we understand for example that the page is white if it's white like how do we make sure we contrast correctly you know yeah. similarly i talk a lot about viewability i think view i'm fascinated by viewability Bra and brands are obsessed with viewability <laughs> right never ask a question about the tv viewability but when it comes course, to right. <laughs> you know we've got to know everything you know you got to absolutely everything um but like i'm I find it so interesting that viewability hasn't been used as a metric, for example, for creative, you know, like if you know, and you can create a data set, for example, around how long the ad is in view, like, doesn't that mean, and shouldn't that inform how you execute the creative? Like if it's only going to be in view for one second, there's a, you should make sure that actually you're, you're only showing the ad for, you know, the end frame of the ad, for example. If you know that that actually is a longer piece of content or it's a video piece of content, you can, you know, run a longer piece of content or a longer animation. But I think the point is that all of these different data sets that sit outside of audiences are there and underutilized, right. right? And they can be used to inform the creative execution and they will be used to inform the creative execution. And of course, context is one of them. Viewability is another you know, there's so many things that are outside, you know, we obviously in the UK are well versed in these GDPR, like compliance, um, I guess, I think I was going to say challenges, but I'm not sure that's the right word. But like, um, I guess, situation where we, we have for some time been handling the privacy challenges um, or situation. And so like, this isn't new for us as an EMEA business, you know, we're used to, to handling this kind of thing. And, you know, GDPR has created an opportunity for advertisers to focus actually a bit more on content. And that's really what, what we've seen is so exciting over here. Um, so, you know, I think, whilst I do think the industry is evolving, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think that the evolution will be good for our business and hopefully remind advertisers of the importance of thinking digital first. Um, and I still think there's huge amounts of opportunity right, that are underutilized. And, and that's what I'm excited about. Great, great. Well, you know, the, obviously, there are some other standalone DCO uh, folks uh, like Flash Talking. And I believe there was some recent news with regards to Walmart's acquisition of, of Thunder's tech. Um, so, you know, wh wh what do you think that means for the industry? Do you, do you that think that just validates the upside opportunity for everybody? Totally, right? I think if Walmart are out there buying a DCO provider or, you know, I think Thunder would probably call itself like a creative management platform, but there's an appreciation, you know, we talked about creative data earlier. What brand doesn't want to know what deals ran and when? What brand doesn't want to know, you know, which images outperformed and which talent worked when they're run against specific audiences? Like this idea of like the creative, creative data and creative powering the performance of advertising is so important. I think the Walmart acquisition has just backed it up. Like huge congratulations to, you know, my friend and me at um, Thunder. You know, like I, you know, it's really, really exciting. Um, and I think, you know, for the industry in general, it signals very clearly that there's an expectation that management of feed content, for example, optimization of that content. Like we work with this massive retailer, actually, good example, like last year, and over the uk they were running different deals and you know the the feeds that they had were they were like fresh it was fresh product feeds right um so it was like steaks and fish and milk and all these kind of things and like the difference in engagement by region was just quite phenomenal mm -hmm. so the idea that this brand had for years been running you know an image of steaks you know across the whole uk 
when like actually in large parts of the UK there was no engagement it was kind of crazy looking back at it and now they've deployed you know this approach everywhere you know and they're running multiple markets but the point is like as soon as you start to run things like DCO or creative testing the learnings are so powerful and I think that's what you know these brands get really excited about and I should imagine that's what Walmart got excited about with the acquisition of Thunder they wanted creative control and they wanted to be able to message correctly um, I think you know they're building out a whole proposition in this area and i'm really excited to see how it develops because it's, it's fantastic for us in the industry one common thing between you know walmart uh and thunder and and yourselves and the retailer is the fact that um the, the, the retailer in their in their case walmart or in your case the retail client have some first party data as well so are you integrating in the 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 anonymized first party data into your creative decisioning or are you using you know, or are you sort of leaving that out of the equation for the time being? So we are, but we're going to do it via the media buying entities. I so rather than onboarding the data segments into our own platform, which comes with a whole load of complications from, you know, you know, GDPR requirements to complexities around the cookie, et cetera, et cetera, to building our own match tables, you know, like actually the big partners of in this space, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they're doing this stuff for us and they're passing us those segments as an ID, you know, and saying like, here's this audience bucket. And they're suggesting that, you know, more and more we just use that ID to trigger the different creative variations. And that's what our focus has been on. Of course, there's some challenges around that and it's not the perfect way to be doing things, but actually it creates a level of security between us and the brand you know it means that there isn't data leakage and data loss and i think for big brands now that i mean it will i don't know whether it's like hit the us but it's a very serious thing over in in emir it's a very very serious thing people take this their data security very seriously and i don't think that's going away i think it's going to get worse so the fact we can say you know what trust your big partners trust you know we aren't a billion town pound business probably will be one day kevin but we aren't at the moment <laughs> um but trust those guys to, to help you and support you to manage the onboarding of your first party data keep it secure and hashed you know and all that kind of thing and we'll purely use ids you know that reference a you know a cohort of users to trigger a creative execution i think that's actually very attractive to big advertisers in this day and age I would agree. And uh, in relation to you guys eventually being one of those billion dollar organizations, <laughs> I think you guys had some news recently uh, with regards to getting you there more quickly. Yeah, it's super exciting. And thanks for bringing it up. We, we did just uh, raise another round of investment, which is a huge and I'm uh, over the moon and a massive call out to Adit, our CEO and Manu, our president of Americas, Stacy, who did all the work on the finance side and Ed on our engineering side. It's been like a whirlwind of a journey, but we we got there in the end. We raised another um, six and a half million dollars um, to take us to the next level. Um, I think that was off the back of like 280% growth in 2020, which, you know, I'm absolutely chuffed about in a year that was very challenging for many um, reasons. I'm so pleased that our advertisers and partners chose to stick with us you know i was really touched and continue working with us right like it's an easy time to to cut partners and actually you know creative and managing the messaging and the agility required to respond to such an extraordinary set of circumstances i think if anything customers realized this stuff was more and more powerful um and you know we're seeing that you know as we continue to grow into 2021 but yeah it's a it's a very exciting time for the business um you know I guess the, the main investment, Kevin, you'll be pleased to hear is going into the US. <laughs> so that's really where we're going to be growing um, this year. We've got a fantastic leadership team out there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped. I, I uh, spent the first sort of couple of years of this journey on the plane. And, we've, you know, we've opened all over the world. We're in Dubai and Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong um Australia, uh, Madrid. So I've spent a lot of time traveling and you know, opening businesses. And I'm just super excited that, you know, actually we've got there with the US. We've done it slightly backwards in some ways. I think some customers and companies immediately opened the, in the US. Um, we've learned, 
from those other markets and built the product and developed our customer base. And I think now's the time, you know, really got a differentiation um, to go into the US and, 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 and build a business there. Well, congratulations on your growth thus far. And, uh, you know, to some extent, due to the regulatory and privacy implications of, of launching elsewhere, um, to, to some extent, you're ahead of the game here, right? So when you get to the United States. That's what I'm hoping. I think, we, you know, like I sit on lots of these calls and there is, you know, you talked about like the mobile situation and you talked about the cookie situation. And these things are things we have already experienced to a certain extent. You know, not exactly, but GDPR has created these these things, uh, made these things challenging. And there's rules and regulations and um, requirements, all of which we've had to build for and follow. And so that understanding, I think, will help us, I hope, be successful um, in the US because I think brands will start to take it very seriously. They have a responsibility to their users and their customers to take it very seriously. Um, so we'll see. Great, great. Well, obviously, um, you know, you're excited about uh, growing the business in the U US and internationally, but are there specific elements of either your product roadmap or, or strategy that you're executing that, that's as far as like what's next for ad lib that make you particularly excited? So I, so yes, actually. So we talk, I've talked a bit about creative data and I've talked a bit about um, sort of, I guess, creative agility, both of which I think are really important. The ones that I'm really excited about, I think the first is creative governance. So helping brands understand what good looks like. We're not going to design the ad, you know, we're not going to tell them, you know, they need to do this CTA here or that image there. But what we can do is help with things like eligibility. So what's going to make sure you can get to market faster and make sure that, you know, the content that you build is going to get approved by all of the different approvals infrastructures inside Google, Facebook, Amazon, whatever it might be. Um, trying to encourage brands to, to think mobile first and that sort of thing. Like, are you, you're going live. Okay. Have you thought about, um, you know, mobile, like, have you considered app, you know, this sort of thing. So I think just like nudging, you know, the users of our tool, that there's a lot of opportunity outside of, you know, what they may be thinking. Um, and we've got like quite an interesting release coming, which is going to help basically reference what the, the advertisers goals are. So, you know, conversion, awareness, et cetera, and recommend different formats that we think will be eligible for the campaign or different channels. So I'm quite excited about that. The other thing I'm really excited about is scalability. And this is something we've been working on for a long time uh, in the other regions. You know, how does, you know, a bank like HSBC and APAC deliver content across, you know, 12 Asian markets where there's different character fonts and there's different image requirements and different best practice and all of that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we've worked through those problems. And I think as we get into the US and we're talking to Latin markets, Portuguese and Spanish, et cetera, et cetera, we'll face similar challenges. You know, what are the cultural requirements of the ad? Like, how do we make sure the brand's on the money? This stuff is extremely important now, more, more important now than ever. Um, and so I think that ability to scale content, you know, and, and even scale content outside of advertising, I'm like really excited by. Um, so I think we'll see, you know, a lot of release in that space um, in the next few months. Great, great. Well, one final question. Do you, do you think that, it, that um, you'll see more uh, initial engagement and interest within the, the, the brand advertising side of the budget or within the direct response side of the advertising budget? Good question. Um, I want it, I think, to be in the brand side because I think, look, we're never going to disrupt the hero content and that will always go out. But on the brand side now, it is an audience-led strategy. And if you've got different audiences that you're targeting, you should, I believe, take the time to get the message right to those audiences. Right. It feels like a big miss. You know, there's a stat that's out there that 97% of ads still have no targeted creative despite the hours and hours that have been put into the media targeting strategy and so i just think it feels like a, a very basic hygiene requirement that you know brands are spending the time when they're doing their upper funnel activity to think about how they personalize or make that message relevant 
of course the example from the retailer that we talked about earlier is super interesting and those kind of things we'll 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 see more of and i think the the critter s creative like where there's no effort put into the content will slowly you know disappear and i hope be replaced by more um uh you know or or improved uh, lower funnel creative um but yeah there will always be you know product remarketing and that kind of thing right um but yeah i think my goal is to try and i guess impact you know the biggest area possible which is the the brand budgets right right great well well thanks ali for for joining me this is a fascinating conversation and i look forward to watching your continued uh, evolution and your continued uh, rollout uh, here in the, here in the states my pleasure kevin i really enjoyed it thank you so much for having me this evening